Renal Physiology, Part 1, by Loriano Andrade Vicente and the MCAT Disciples. So, here is the topic list that we're going to be going through today. What we'll do is, in this lecture, in this Part 1, we'll go through the anatomy of the, of the urinary system, and then we'll go through the function, the basic renal processes. And then in the next lecture, we'll go through regulation of blood pressure, which the kidney is keenly involved in as well as some pathological conditions, and we will also integrate with the cardiovascular physiology lectures to really make a complete picture here. So without further ado, we shall begin. The urinary system. Here in this figure, we are showing the urinary system and a few other surrounding organs. You'll notice the kidneys, we have two of them. It's probably not news to you. They're more towards the back. They're more towards the back, rather uh, dorsally as opposed to ventrally. And coming off from the kidneys, draining the kidneys are two vessels, two structures called the ureters. And those will flow into a dome-shaped structure called the bladder. The bladder will then be drained by the urethra and that will go out into the external environment then. And that's where, that is how we get rid of urine. What the kidneys do, what they're in the business of doing, is, you know, uh, apart from their many other functions, in this context they are creating urine that then goes through the ureters and fills into the bladder. That bladder serves as a storage vessel, and at some point, either we choose to go to the restroom on our own, or our body forces us to, we urinate, we micturate, and we and we empty out the bladder through the ureter and out to the external environment. So the first thing we're gonna go through is that, that process. So micturition is a medical speak for urination. Okay, so I wanna first talk about the innovations to the bladder as well as the as the muscles that are involved then in, in holding the fluid within the bladder. So we have the bladder itself and then we have this muscular structure and in fact the inner portion of this muscular structure is actually smooth muscle while the outer portion here at the rim is skeletal muscle. As you know smooth muscle is under autonomic control um, particularly parasympathetic or sympathetic control, while the external sphincter is going to be either volitional or voluntary control. So when you're filling, so you're, you're not urinating, you're filling, you're drinking, whatever, um, the kidneys are concentrating urine and, and sending it through the ureters into the bladder, filling up the bladder. Okay, And you fill up to a point where you start to feel too much of a pressure and then you'll have to urinate. Well, under those conditions, you have your motor neurons contracting the external sphincter so that that's volitional control and you're not always doing that you can decide not to do it if you don't want to because at the end of the day the internal sphincter is going to be passively contracted by the parasympathetic neurons not shown here let's not get complicated yet that's that's feeling that's relaxed state well imagine this imagine you're uh, on the GWB or if you live in let's say California you're on that that big old that big old bridge you guys got over there Golden Gate Bridge, and the cup, of, the you know, the cup of coffee you had that morning is starting to work on you a little bit. Well, after some time, you know, it's been two hours. There's an accident on the road, and those cups of coffee really starting to work on you. And I'm sure you know this just from experience that coffee makes you urinate. But it turns out coffee is actually a diuretic. It actually inhibits the release of arginine vasopressin, or the, another name for it is antidiuretic hormone. Which, if you don't know already, you'll know by next lecture that antidiuretic hormone increases the secretion of aquaporin channels which then increases the resorption of water well if you're inhibiting the release of arginine vasopressin you're going to get a diuresis you're going to get an increase in the production of urine at some point your bladder will be filled and the pressure in the bladder will be so great that you'll initiate the urination reflex so what happens is the sensory neuron a sensory neuron a cell body that will depolarize and fire action potentials toward the cns when sensing a strong enough pressure Okay, the pressure gated channel there that open and then depolarize and fire action potentials. Well, when that gets to the central nervous system, there are a few interneurons that it's going to go through. The first interneuron it's going to go through is going to be synapse, and it's going to be an activating interneuron um, that will activate the parasympathetic neuron, preganglionic neuron to postganglionic neuron to the bladder. And it'll actually cause the bladder to contract, the smooth muscles of the bladder to contract, right? And that'll start to then detrust, the detrusor muscle will, will detrust the fluid out into the urethra. But the, 
there has to be more than that going on because if there wasn't and i'm sure you know this just from experience that coffee makes you urinate but it turns out coffee is actually a diuretic it actually inhibits the release of arginine based suppressant or the, another name for it is antidiuretic hormone which if you don't know already you'll know by next lecture that antidiuretic hormone increases the secretion of aquaporin channels which then increases the resorption of water well if you're inhibiting the release of arginine vasopressin, you're going to get a diuresis. You're going to get an increase in the production of urine. So, functions of the kidney. The kidney acts as a filter. What it does is it takes blood, it filters it, everything gets filtered, and then we, we pick up what we need to pick up. Okay? Under a certain size. Now, it filters everything under a certain size. So, something that you'll never find in filtrate um, is blood, for example. You'll never find red blood cells in filtrate. And you'll never find large proteins like albumin in filtrate unless it's a pathological condition and that'd be a situation where you'd want to go to see your physician. Anyway, something to filter is drugs and antibiotics. The function of that then is to remove foreign substance. Okay. Ions, you'll filter sodium, potassium, calcium, hydrogen ion, bicarbonate, ammonium ion, and that is regulation of water and salt balance and pH balance. We'll have a lot to say about all of these except for perhaps the ammonium ion and the calcium. You, it also functions and, and gets rid of metabolic waste products such as urea, creatinine, uric acid, and ammonium. So the urea and the uric acid, essentially same thing, are coming from uh, purine degradation whereas the ammonium ion is coming from uh, amino acid degradation. But that's just removable met metabolic waste products. It also serves as a minor site for gluconeogenesis. I mentioned that in the biochemistry lectures that under under conditions of, of very, very low glucose, it'll serve as a site for gluconeogenesis. The other site that does it is the liver. The only two things, two organs in the body that can undergo gluconeogenesis, that's gonna be the kidney and the liver. And the, the reason for that is that they have all the enzymes present required to run gluconeogenesis. It serves as a site for extramedullary hematopoiesis. I already discussed that in the cardiovascular system lecture. Then that's only times of serious blood loss that that occurs. Normally, um, hematopoiesis will occur at the bone marrow. And it secretes hormones on one major enzyme. So the hormone that it secretes is the hematopoietin or erythropoietin. As the name suggests, it, it upregulates and stimulates um, hematopoiesis which is just blood develop blood cell development, so the red blood cell and the leukocytes. Yeah, it also secretes 1,25-dihydroxy vitamin, vitamin D3, and that's associated with calcium homeostasis. As you may know, the other source of vitamin D3 that we have is, is our skin and UV light. When UV light hits our skin, we are able to synthesize this, this compound, vitamin D3. You probably know, you may not know, I'll just tell you very quickly that calcium, the, uh, rather the vitamin D3, will increase bone mineralization and will increase uh, calcium absorption from the intestines. Okay. The kidneys also secrete a hormone called, re an enzyme rather, called renin. Okay. It, what it does is it converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and then via ACE you'll convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. It's very important for pressure homeostasis as well as water salt balance as you come to appreciate in the second lecture that we'll go through. That's the, that's called the RAS system, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, RAS. Now, there's a mnemonic to try to remember all the functions of the kidney. It's called a wet bed. Now, I don't recommend you try to memorize this because there's no need to. Because by the end of the two lectures, you'll, you'll know all of these functions without having to use a mnemonic. Because it just wouldn't make sense that you don't know what these functions are after all the things we've gone through. But anyway, here it is. So why don't we talk about the kidney structure a little bit and get a little bit into more detail about it so then we can talk about the basic renal functions. So we're going to blow up this structure a little bit, not too much, but a little bit. What you'll see here is that we'll have a renal cortex, which is the outer region, cortex outer, and a renal medulla. So these are the renal medulla region, these regions in like, you know, the darker red with the lines in them. And the renal cortex is this lighter area right here. Now, these renal medullas feed into then the calces. That's plural for calyx. The calyx is just a structure in which the collecting ducts, which you'll, we haven't talked about yet, will feed into and, and feed their filtrate into then the calyx. And the calyces will form and coalesce to form then the renal pelvis, which then goes on to form the ureter. The blood supply 
to the kidney that are going to be from the renal artery and the renal vein. These are coming from the aorta and the inferior vena cava, respectively. And then that brings us then into the more molecular structure of the kidney, which is going to be the nephron. So the nephron, the kidney nephron, is found in both the cortex and the medulla. So the starting cortex and end in medulla. There are two types, a juxtamedullary nephron and a cortical nephron. I'm not going to make a distinction between the two, and you sh probably shouldn't either because the function of them are the same. The only thing they differ in is the length in which they drop into the medulla, as well as the vasculature that surrounds the nephron, however, essentially the function is going to be the same. Another thing of note here is that this whole thing is the nephron. So this whole thing is the functional unit of the kidney, the nephron. So why don't we go through the, the structure. What you have is the renal corpuscle. Now the renal corpuscle is made up of three structures. The And this is going from out from it, from it out to in. You got the Bowman's capsule. Then you have the, the Bowman space. And then the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the capillary bed. And the glomerulus is where blood gets filtered. And one thing of note here is that this glomerulus, this capillary bed, is unlike any other capillary bed you've ever seen so far, in the sense that this is not about the exchange of gases. So it's not about the exchange of O2 or CO2, because as you'll note, the afferent arterial coming in and the efferent arterial coming out are the same color. So no gas exchange is occurring here. This is all about filtration and nothing else. So why don't I walk you through what happens when we filter blood. We filter blood at the glomerulus, this capillary bed. We filter blood and it goes into then the proximal convoluted tubule. This is found right here. Eventually, it's going to reach the loop of Henle, which is this looped structure. You have the descending limb of the loop of Henle, then the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Then we get to reach a structure called the macula denda. They are important in auto-regulating um, the kidney, which we'll talk about later. Get into the distal convoluted tubule and then the collecting duct. You can break that up in the cortical collecting duct and medullary collecting duct, but collecting duct is fine. At the collecting duct, we'll then go into form, then these collecting ducts will, will empty out into the calces, which will then go form the renal pelvis, into the ureter, into bladder, and then out through the urethra. And that is the structure of the nephron. All right, I'll also go through in this little slide format. You start at the glomerulus and go into Bowman space in here, proximal convoluted tubule. Descending loop of Henle, ascending loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, cortical collecting duct, medullary collecting duct, then out through the renal pelvis. Okay? However, this really isn't a complete picture because we're not showing the blood supply. So why don't I show you the blood supply? Here it is. And here's the juxtamedullary nephron. I mentioned there's two types of nephron, cortical and juxtamedullary. The medullary tends to deep down digger and has a different type of vasculature associated with it as opposed to the cortical, which is stayed more cortical or more towards the cortex or the outer region but let's not make that distinction again the structure is very similar here all i did was add then the vasculature and you'll notice that these peritubular capillaries all of these are peritubular capillaries all these vessels these peritubular capillaries here are juxtaposed to our peri to the tubules and what they function to do is they will reabsorb and secrete solutes into and out of the tubules and that'll function to either concentrate or dilute solute or, or I guess a solution rather they have a special name for the vessels that course with the loop of Henle and that's called the vasorecta and they are juxtaposed to the loop of Henle and in fact are in a counter current exchange mechanism with the loop of Henle which will go through probably toward the end of the lecture and that's the structure Another structure that, are, that is very, rather important to us is the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and it's going to become important to us in the context of autoregulation as well as sympathetic regulation or external regulation to glomular filtration rate, or the rate at which we filter fluid at the glomerulus. So that's the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Again, the name juxtaglomerular is right next to the glomerulus. What we have here is probably nothing new to you if, if you were paying attention, but it is new. So this is the JGA apparatus, juxtaglomerular apparatus. And this is a cell involved in here. So why don't we go through the structure? We'll start with the macula denda cells. These macula denda cells are found on the distal tubule. So this is a distal tubule, the same distal tubule that I showed you in the last slide, except looking at it cross section. These macula denda cells are sensors of sodium ion that are flowing through the distal tubule, and they will react to different changes in the concentration of sodium ion that are against normal. 
and they will secrete paracrine signals, local signals, onto the so-called granular cells and as well as the afferent arterial. One of the things that they secrete is going to be a paracrine to activate granular cells to secrete renin. The other paracrine they're going to secrete is going to affect the afferent arterial and will cause for vasoconstriction. And then the absence of paracrine will cause for vasodilation. That is what the macula then the cells are involved in. Again, we'll go through it later. Yeah, the granular cells. Now, the granular cells will secrete renin. Renin, as I mentioned earlier already, is part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the RAS system, RAAS. Renin will cleave angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, which will then convert to angiotensin 2, which via ACE, and then that acts as a potent vasoconstrictor as well as plays some functions, such as the re release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. That's the granular cells. And that is under sympathetic innervation as well. So the, it's the sympathetic nerve, as we'll go through later as well, will induce the secretion of renin by the granular cells. So it will induce the RAS system, which is usually induced under, under conditions of low blood pressure. So we'll go through that. You also have the podocytes. So the podocytes are what make up, what make this capillary bed a filtering capillary bed and what makes it selective. Because in fact, these podocytes, they're just cells, but these cells make up a molecular sieve. And that molecular sieve looks something like this, where only very small molecules will get through this molecular sieve and will, and, and that that's what makes it a filter. So for example, a sodium ion can get through this very easily. However, a big protein like albumin cannot get through this. A big a big cell like the red blood cell cannot get through this molecular sieve, this sieve, this semi-permeable barrier. And that's what makes it a filter, okay? Now I would love to show you this video animation of what's going on in the urinary system, but in fact, I don't have the copyrights for it, so I cannot. However, I encourage you to go to this, pause, the, pause our lecture and go to this link and watch the video. It'd be, I think it'd be very informative to you. On YouTube as Betty Smith RN. All right, so we filter actually about 100 liters of fluid a day, per day. That's how much we fill, that's a lot. However, we only urinate about 1.5 liters. So where do you think all that volume goes? Can't all be, you know, if we filter 180 liters a day, if that's all we did, then we'd have to urinate 180 liters a day, but clearly we don't do that. We only urinate about 1.5. So where does all that volume go? Well. It goes through reabsorption and secretion. There are three major processes that occur at the renal, at the at the renal system, and that is going to be filtration, secretion, and reabsorption. I suppose you can count excretion as the fourth, but that that just happens passively. So filtration again, you get you get to the glomerulus and you filter, right? The podocytes make up the sieve, and and you filter everything except essentially red blood cells and large proteins. Then what can happen is you can do some active or passive secretion as well as some active or passive reabsorption. So the amount excreted is going to be equal to the amount filtered plus the amount secreted minus the amount reabsorbed. It turns out for the sodium ion, we, we reabsorb about 99.5% of the amount filtered. Turns out for the glucose, we reabsorb under normal conditions on 100% of the glucose that we filter. Turns out for urea, we secrete about, excrete rather, 50% of all the urea that we filter. So, probably wondering what that's about. Well, if I have time to talk about it, I will, but we're, it, it's involved in making up the concentration gradient that is found within the medulla of the kidney. But, anyway, that's how you calculate the amount excreted. So, you have three major processes that occur, filtration, secretion, reabsorption, then excretion. So here's just taking a more in-depth look about what's going on. So we filter here at the glomerulus, get into Bowman space, go through the proximal convoluted tubule where we can do some reabsorption and some secretion that can be either passive or, passive or active. We can go into the loop of Henle where we do some reabsorptions on the descending limb. And then on the ascending limb, we also do some reabsorptions. We get to the distal convoluted tubule, we do some reabsorption and some secretion. And then we get to the collecting duct cells where we can do a variable amount of reabsorption and secretion because it turns out the only part of this that is under physiological regulation is going to be the collecting duct. The rest of this happens without any input from us. So we can't really change anything that's happening at the, at the distal and proximal convoluted tubule 
or the loop of Henle. Only thing we can change is the collecting duct. So that's going to be our point of regulation down the line. So what we'll do now is take an even closer look about the basic renal processes and the reabsorption and secretions that are occurring here. So why don't we re reiterate the structure. What we have here is the renal corpuscle. So it goes Bowman's capsule, Bowman space, then the glomerulus. The glomerulus is that capillary bed that where filtration occurs via the podocytes there making up that filtration slit. Everything gets filtered except for large protein and red blood cells. Then the filtrate travels from the lumen of Bowman space into then the proximal convoluted tubule. At that location, there are a number of active and passive transports that occur. In terms of reabsorption, and the terminology reabsorption and secretion is from the point of view of the blood vessel. So the peritubial capillary surrounding these, the tubule, the, the tubular lumen. Other reabsorptions that occur are sodium chloride as well as other nutrients, so glucose, for example. Secretions involve potassium ion, active transport of potassium ion secretion into the tubular lumen. And then passive reabsorption, they're going to be water, potassium ion, bicarbonate. Passive secretions are going to be ammonium ion. That's at the proximal convoluted tubule. As we move down to the descending limb of the loop of Henle, we have passive reabsorption of water. That comes from the fact that there's a concentration gradient for water to go down. Water goes where solute goes. And in fact, as we move from cortex into medulla, the concentration gradient is actually increasing out here. Part of that is built up from urea as well as excess solute left out of here. We'll go through that at the end of the lecture. Anyway, water will move where solute is given that it has a, a pathway for it down to flow. This pathway would be an aquaporin channel. And you'll see that's relevant because at the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, you have sodium chloride passive transport and you have sodium chloride active transport as you move up a little bit, but you don't see water following. The reason why water is not following here is because there's no aquaporin channels for water to follow. Then we get to then the distal convoluted tubule, where we have, in terms of reabsorption, we have active reabsorption of sodium chloride and bicarbonate and passive water following. It's always passive. Water reabsorption is always passive. And in terms of secretion, we have proton and, and, and potassium ion secrete, being actively secreted into the tubular lumen here. Then we get to the collecting duct. So this is this portion right here. Within the collecting duct, we have active transport of potassium ion active reabsorption of sodium chloride, and then passive reabsorption of water and urea. Recall we reabsorb about 40, 45-50% of the urea that we filter, filter. Now, the only portion of this that's under physiological regulation is going to be the collecting duct. So we can change how much potassium we secrete. We can change how much sodium chloride we reabsorb, and hence how much water we reabsorb. We can change the aqua, number of aquaporin channels within the collecting duct. However, we can't change any of these. These are not under physiological regulation. And that's going to be important, and that's why the, there is a reason for showing you all this, because you can't change this, whereas you can change this. So let's continue. What I'll go through next are just going to be some things about units, because although you should know this already, you might not, and I don't want you to be lost, so I'll do a review session. All right, so we'll start with osmotic pressure. So here's how you calculate osmotic pressure in general chemistry. It's the molarity times the Van't Hoff factor, which accounts for dissociating ions. You have the ideal gas um, equation, the ideal gas constant, as well as temperature. Osmotic pressure. It's a measure of a tendency of the tendency of a solvent to move into another solution via osmosis. Osmosis is just the movement of water. In a more understandable term, it's the amount of pressure one must apply to prevent the movement of water. So I have a figure for you. Here's just a normal U-tube, and it has a semi-permeable membrane. That membrane is permeable to water, but not solute, so not these ions here that are in solution. Now, what's going to happen is water is going to go where salt goes. That's the mnemonic. Water goes where salt goes. Okay, so water goes down its concentration gradient into then the highly concentrated salt solution. So you'll notice there's less water here than there is here now. Turns out that there's a pressure associated with that water movement, and you can quantify that pressure by putting a piston here and preventing that water from, from moving into this side of the U-tube. So it's the pressure required to oppose osmosis is going to be the, equal to the osmotic pressure. This isn't the pressure itself. The pressure is the pressure of this water pushing in this way, which is equal to the piston, because that's the pressure you're applying to prevent it from moving, from changing height here. So osmotic pressure is just the tendency of, of fluid, water, to move from one solution to another into a solution that has higher solvent concentration. That's all it is. Water goes or salt goes. That's the mnemonic. Osmotic pressure, the colligative property. It depends on a number, not kind. 
To get an accurate look at the osmotic properties of a solution, physiologists needed a unit that accounts for compound dissociating in solution. Hence, the unit osmolarity was born. The way I want you to appreciate this is just going to be through way of example. So, one molar ethane in solution is equal to one osmol. So, osmolar. That's what that said, the one osmolar. But one molar sodium chloride in solution is two osmolar because you have the sodium and the chloride that dissociate to form that one molar sodium ion and one molar chloride ion in order to account for that because that changes then the osmotic pressure of the solution because the osmotic pressure is a colligative property it depends on number not kind in order to account for that physiologist said you know what we need to make a new unit that then clearly tells us what the properties of a solution with x amount of of substance in it is going to be like and so they made the osmolarity unit. So two osmolar that accounts for the, these ions dissociating. And here are the, the units that you might cut, run into. So you might see os with a big M, so that's osmolar. You might also see it with a little m, so that's osmoles, right? And then milliosmolar, that's just the milli prefix, so 10 to the negative three osmolar. And then same thing here, just milliosmoles. The normal extracellular fluid osmolarity is 300 milliosmoles. Clearly, if it's extracellular fluid osmolarity, it's also vasculature osmolarity. The next thing we should talk about is tonicity, because people often get these things confused. Although they are related, they're not the same thing. So we'll go through it. Normal milliosmolar osmolar is going to be 300. And now this next portion really isn't relevant to what we're going to talk about today, but if there was ever a time to talk about it, it's, it would be right now. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to differentiate between osmolarity and tonicity, which I'm sure is something that you've heard about before. Osmolarity is typically used at the organismal level and requires no reference point. Tonicity is used at the cellular level and requires a reference point. That tonicity is the relative ability of a solution has to move water into and out of or out of a cell. So what, the best way to go through this example. So if you have an isoosmotic solution, an isoosmotic solution is where the osmolarity or the the osmolarity of the intracellular fluid is equal to the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. That would be an example of also an isotonic solution. An isotonic solution is where on a net basis, the movement of water in is equal to the movement of water out. So it's isotonic, there's no net movement of water. There's no net change in shape of the cell. We can talk about a hypotonic solution. And so here's where your knowledge of what water does is helpful. If you remember the mnemonic, water goes where salt goes, then you remember that hypotonic just means that there's less salt in the water solution than in the red blood cell intracellular fluid, you'll know that water is going to go into the red blood cell in this case. And it's going to lyse the red blood cell if it's strong enough, if it's a strong enough hypotonic solution. So that is where, that kind of solution is where in, in I guess in the nomenclature form, the osmolarity of the intracellular fluid is greater than the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid space. All you have to remember is that the reference point here is going to be hypotonic, is going to be hypotonic solution. That means low salt solution, high intracellular salt. That means what is going to go where the salt is inside the red blood cell. If it's a hypertonic solution, that means there's a lot of salt in the in the, in the fluid, in the extracellular fluid space, very little salt within the within the red blood cell itself. So water is going to go where salt is, which is outside the cell, it's going to shrivel. That shouldn't be that difficult. So I think <laughs> After that conversation that we just had, it would be quite sequitur to talk about the osmolarity changes during the flow through the nephron. So when we filter at, at the glomerulus into Bowman space, the filtrate actually has an osmolarity equal to that of blood. That tells you something. That tells you that we filtered essentially whole blood, minus the red blood cells, minus the proteins, and it came out iso isoosmotic. So it's isoosmotic between blood and filtrate. After we go through the proximal tubule and we do our reabsorption and our secretion, it turns out that the fluid that comes out of the proximal tubule is actually still isoosmotic. All that tells you is that the amount of which we reabsorbed and secreted with solute was equal to the amount we reabsorbed and secreted with water. So any, any anything that we did here, we did it isoosmotically. If we pulled up two sodium molecules, we pulled up two water molecules. So it came out isoosmotic. Then we get to the loop of Henle. And when it goes through the loop of Henle, you'll notice that the descending limb of the loop of Henle, this limb, there's only water reabsorbed. There's no solute. So clearly that's going to concentrate the filtrate as we go through the loop of Henle. And at the bottom, it's as, as concentrated as it's ever going to be. And on the ascending limb, 
were only permeable to ion, particularly sodium chloride, but not water. So what that's going to do is that we're going to reabsorb, we're going to be losing sodium chloride from the tubular lumen, and that's going to lead to then a decrease in the osmolarity of fluid. That's going to be leave you a very dilute fluid. We go through the distal tubule, and then at the end of the distal tubule, we get to the collecting duct. Now, this is variable amount of reabsorption in water of so water and solutes when we get here. What that's telling you is that under physiological regulations, we can either end up with a filtrate equal to 50 osmolar, and that that'd be a very dilute urine, or we can have a very concentrated urine with about 200 milliosmoles in terms of in terms of concentration. Well, milliosmolar in terms of concentration. And that would be under physiological regulation. It depends on the physiological condition that we're in. If we're very dehydrated, you can bet that our, our urine is going to be very concentrated because all of our water is being reabsorbed here. You can think of other situations where it would change this, which we'll go through some of them. What we'll go through now is the regulation of these basic renal processes. Those include determinants of glomerular filtration, regulation of glomerular filtration rate, reabsorption and secretion. We'll start with determinants of glomerular filtration. So as the name suggests, glomerular filtration is just a filtration that occurs at the glomerulus, that tuft of capillary beds here. And there are three factors that you need to consider when calculating the net filtration pressure, or the, or the net pressure that is generated in the outward direction that is towards then the lumen of Bowman space and the lumen of the proximal convoluted tubule. That's going to be the hydrostatic pressure minus the, the addition, the summation of the oncotic pressure or the colloid osmotic pressure and the hydrostatic pressure due to then the fluid within Bowman space. So let's go through each one. The hydrostatic pressure, what is that? Another, another word, another name for that is blood pressure. It's just the pressure due to the fluid within the blood vessel hitting up on the side wall of the glomerulus. It has a value of about 55 millimeters of mercury. That's the hydrostatic pressure. That's nothing new to you. That's not a new term for you. Then you have pi. That's the oncotic pressure. Just a special word for the pressure due to the proteins in plasma that are not found within Bowman space. So let's discuss that. I told you that when we filter, we filter everything except red blood cells and large proteins. So that immediately tells you that there are large proteins in blood that are not found in Bowman space. And there is an osmotic pool due to those proteins there, that differential distribution of proteins then results in, in a measurement called the oncotic pressure. That has a, a value of about 30 millimeters of mercury. That's the oncotic pressure. And there's also an hy a hydrostatic pressure. There's an hydrostatic pressure, and that's the pressure due to the fluid within Bowman space right here, inward, inward. And that is due to the fact that this is, in fact, an encapsulated area. It's encapsulated. And so there are pressure, there's a, there's a fluid pressure due to, or a hydrostatic pressure inward due to the fluid within Bowman space hitting up on the sidewall of this vessel. So if you subtract, if you take the hydrostatic pressure and you subtract the, the things going out minus the things going in, you'll get a net filtration pressure about 10 millimeters of mercury. There's a few things to appreciate about that, and I think the best way to appreciate it is through an animation. So let's do it. So here we have the hydrostatic pressure, this big old bull, number 55, 55 millimeters of mercury. You have the pressure of fluid, which is about 15 milli millimeters of mercury, and then you got the oncotic pressure, or this bull going inward, and that's going to be 30 millimeters of mercury. You got lumen of glomerulus, is Bowman space here, and the glomerulus itself. So what's going to happen is this. We're going to filter. And it turns out this bull is so big that these guys don't stand a chance. So net filtration is about 10 millimeter milli of mercury, and everything goes out. Okay, we get filtration to occur. Now that's normal. You know that's normal. But how about a pathological condition? How about a condition where we've lost hydrostatic pressure within the glomerulus? For example, our blood pressure is low because we lost we hemorrhaged, so we lost 20% blood volume. What happens then? Well, in that kind of case, the hydrostatic pressure within the glomerulus will decrease to a level of about 45 millimeter of mercury, maybe less. What will happen is we'll have the same interaction, but you'll just get an infiltration pressure equal to zero. Under those kind of conditions, those life-threatening conditions, our kidney will function, will no longer produce filtrate. It will no longer produce filtrate. And in fact, 
you can never get a negative pressure. So you'll never get a negative net filtration pressure. You'll never have these bulls going inward. You'll never have the fluid in Bowman space going inward towards glomerulus. The kidney does not function to add volume to extracellular fluid space. In fact, it only functions to regulate and conserve volume, but it cannot add volume. So if you have a condition where you need volume, for example, you've hemorrhaged out a lot of blood, your kidney can't help you in that way. Only thing it can do is prevent the loss of fluid via forming urine. But it cannot make any more. You don't get this flow inward, okay? You'll, you'll never get a negative net filtration pressure. So note the trend. The kidneys function to regulate blood volume, not add to it, okay? You'll never have a negative net filtration pressure. You'll never get fluid from Bowman space into the glomerulus. That's the determinants of glomerular filtration. We had three. We had hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus just due to fluid volume. We had the hydrostatic pressure from the fluid within Bowman space going inward, and we had the oncotic pressure going inward. The osmotic pressure due to the proteins that are found within glomerulus that are not found in Bowman space. Now we can go through the regulation of glomerular filtration rate, GFR. That's, that's GFR stands for glomerular, glomerular filtration rate, the regulation of it. So there are a few controls. There's the intrinsic and the extrinsic controls. Within the GFR intrinsic control, you have the myogenic autoregulation and the tu tubular glomerular autoregulation. And then in terms of extrinsic control, we have the sympathetic innervation to the afferent arterial. There's also a sympathetic innervation to the efferent, but typically it's, it's, it's through the afferent arterial that we regulate. But we'll go through each one of these. We'll start off with the intrinsic control, which is going to be then... Um, the myogenic autoregulation and the tubular glomerular autoregulation. This has to do with the juxtaglomerular apparatus, actually. So, autoregulation. What autoregulation does and means is that the kidney, all by itself, with no help from anywhere else, can autoregulate itself. It can autoregulate and keep glomerular filtration rate constant at about 180 liters a day. And it'll keep, it'll keep at that glomerular filtration rate no matter if you had a mean arterial pressure of 93, which is normal, all the way up to 180 millimeters of mercury of pressure. It'll keep it at a normal rate, a constant rate, about 180 liters a day. And the way it does that, the mechanism by which it does that is what we're going to go through next. But before we go there, I'm going to have to review with you pressure gradients and absolute pressures because otherwise you won't follow the conversation. So which pressure we're talking about matters, as you know. Blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, delta P is equal to flow times the distance of flow, where you can calculate then the delta P by equaling the pressure at the aorta minus the pressure at the vena cava. That's how you calculate delta P. And it's a pressure gradient, not an absolute pressure. Again, here, here it is here. Uh, and we'll break it up into Bernoulli's law and, and Poiseuille's law. This is Poiseuille's law, and then you have Bernoulli's equation here. And so here are the different situations that you can run into. So I'll give you the example of vasoconstriction first. Say you have a vasoconstriction. What's going to happen is pressure is going to increase behind the point of constriction and pressure is going to decrease within and beyond the point of constriction. That's going to increase the mean arterial pressure, P1 minus P2. Okay, it's going to be greater. So delta P is increased. But again, the pressure here is actually lower than the pressure here. And the same thing, you can have a similar um, talk here. What happens is vasoconstriction will increase the delta P. It will increase resistance. Okay, if you increase resistance, you will increase delta P or mean arterial pressure. How about a vasodilation? Well, okay, vasodilation, you will decrease the pressure behind the point of dilation and increase the pressure beyond it. All right, and that would be then, okay, increase pressure here, de decrease pressure here, and increase pressure here. That's going to decrease mean arterial pressure. If you decrease mean arterial pressure, you can also talk about it via Bernoulli, via Poiseuille's law. By saying, okay, you have an increase in radius, decrease in resistance, decrease in resistance, decrease mean arterial pressure. And how I got the other numbers, so how do I know that vasoconstriction will increase pressure here and decrease pressure here? Well, it's very simple, guys. It's using Bernoulli's equation, okay? What happens is you decrease area here. You've decreased area. That means that then by the continuity equation, Q is equal to AV, you've increased velocity. If you increase velocity at constant height, guess what? Pressure is going to have to decrease there. So pressure decreased at P2, increased at P1, so P1 minus P2, you have an increase in mean arterial pressure. That is how I did those. You should already know how to do that. That should make sense to you if you watched the cardiovascular physiology lectures. Now we can also talk about, and we can look at 
this in a different way. You should appreciate that under normal condition our body tries to maintain a constant pressure. We do that via the barrel receptors in the carotid and aortic arch, for example. Again, delta P is equal to flow times the distance to flow, and here are the different values associated with that. And if the delta P is constant, they have an inverse relationship. So let's say you have these arteries feeding into a bunch of different arterioles, which then feed into the organs. If you constrict a vessel, what's going to happen is it's going to get less flow. It's going to get less fluid volume to it every second. So the more you constrict it, the less flow you get. The more you dilate it, the more flow you get. All right, but the, the flow across all these organs are actually constant. So if you shift, if you constrict this, more fluid just goes here. If you constrict this, more fluid just goes here. If you dilate this where you did, if you dilate that, or if you dilate this where you did here, you'll notice that the organ gets more flow, and then this something else has to get constricted to in order for then the flow to be constant. So all I'm saying here is that they have an inverse relationship. You increase the distance, you decrease flow. Increase flow, I mean, you decrease the distance, you increase flow, assuming that delta P is constant, which typically it is. Now we can go through the myogenic autoregulation. For so the first situation we're going to go through is. Let's say you have an increase in mean arterial pressure, i.e. doing light exercise. So you did, I don't know, some jumping jacks. You have an increase in mean arterial pressure. That is going to be sensed by the afferent arterial. The increased pressure, the increased fluid molecules bumping up against the afferent arterial is going to cause for the depolarization or the opening of some mechanically gated channels that's going to cause for a smooth muscle contraction of the afferent arterial and the decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. So the basic constriction then effect will decrease GFR towards normal. This should make sense to you because you know what? If you increase pressure, you're going to increase the GFR, which happened here. If you decrease the pressure, you're going to decrease the GFR, which happens when you basic constrict. And there's two ways to think about it. Remember, you basic constricted, so then behind the point of constriction, pressure is increased, and but and within it and anything beyond it is going to be lower. So the pressure here is lower. That's just from Bernoulli's equation. The GFR is lower. If the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure here is lower, then GFR is lower. The other way to think about it is that if you vasoconstrict, what you're gonna do is you're gonna divert the flow to other organs, and so there's gonna be less fluid hitting up against the sidewalls here. You're gonna decrease the hydrostatic pressure, decrease GFR towards normal. That shouldn't make sense. How about situation two where there's a decrease in mean arterial pressure? So you take a nap, you decide, you know, let's knock out for a little bit. Well, That'll result in then a decrease in mean arterial pressure. That'll result in a decrease in GFR. Now, what autoregulation wants to do is keep that constant. So what it's going to do, it's going to vasodilate. It's going to vasodilate. What's that going to do to pressure here? It's going to increase, isn't it? Because when you vasodilate, what's going to happen is behind the point of vasodilation, pressure is going to decrease. And within the point of dilation, is going to increase. That's just coming from Bernoulli's equation. You increase area, you decrease velocity. Decrease velocity, you increase pressure at constant height. So this pressure here is increased. So that's going to increase GFR towards normal. That's my identical regulation. Now the molecular mechanism is as follows. You have an increase in intracellular calcium via opening of stretch receptors. Okay, mechanically gated receptors that open up these ion channels. 